Musical Talk, the UK's independent musical theatre podcast. Welcome to another edition of Musical Talk. I'm Thos Ribbits, and when young, I was bitten by a radioactive musical theatre reviewer, which imbued me with superhero powers, namely the power of being able to speak at length about really quite trivial matters. Well, it may not actually seem like a superpower, but it is something I'm going to display in abundance today. But I hope in a way that's sufficiently entertaining that you'll want to stay on till the end of the episode. And if the enticement of me yabbering away isn't exactly what you want to hear, then hopefully if I told you that you'll also be in the company of the very excellent and noted composer Tom Arnold, the writer of The House of Edgar and many other things, as we'll discover, then I hope that will at least sweeten the pill for you a little. Well, what have we got for you today? Well, as you've heard, it's going to be a conversation between me and Tom Arnold for the most part. And actually, it's going to run over two episodes because we are, as part of the Virtual Edinburgh Festival Fringe of 2020, going to be discussing three shows which you could have seen at the Edinburgh Festival Fringes over the last few years and which you can still see because they are available to watch on YouTube and other streaming sites. And those three shows are Redacted Arachnid, Timpson the Musical, and The Toxic Avenger. Now, they're three very different shows, but there are some golden threads between them. Redacted Arachnid is not actually a musical at all, but it is a show about the creation of a musical, and about a very famous musical, which has gone down into the history books as a bit of a failure, whether fairly or otherwise. And that, of course, is the Spider-Man musical of a few years ago. So a rare review and conversation about a show that isn't actually about a musical, but is about a show which is about a musical, if you see what I mean. And then after that, we'll be hearing about Timpson, the musical, which for non-British listeners is a musical about the imaginary birth and creation of a long-standing British and much-loved company that can still be found in most high streets. That's Timpson. And they're principally known for shoe repairs and key cutting. And despite that, I can assure you now that the show is anything but a load of old cobblers. And then Tom and I went on to discuss The Toxic Avenger, which you could have seen at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe in 2017 and elsewhere. But for the most part, that element of the conversation will be available to hear next week. But that's not all. The conversation with Tom was recorded only a few weeks ago and it is our contemporary review of the recordings of the shows that we were talking about. But just to spice it up a little, at the end of today's conversation, you'll also get to hear a 10-minute extract of a conversation I had with Colin Malloy about Redacted Arachnid, which he and I recorded in 2019 after we'd both seen it at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe of that year. And as if that wasn't enough, we are showering you in abundance today because today we'll also be hearing two songs from the pen of Tom Arnold. They're not specifically from musical theatre shows, but he is a musical theatre writer. And I think any creativity that's come to fruition during this terrible year of lockdown is worth hearing. And Tom's work is always worth enjoying as well. So... In a few minutes, before we go into that conversation with Tom, which is going to be about Redacted Arachnid and Timpson the Musical, you'll be able to hear a song called The Starry Night, which is inspired by Van Gogh's famous painting of the same name. This was recorded in lockdown and is here sung by Mickey Joe Butcher and Beth Clarence. And then after my conversation with Tom, you'll hear another song from his incredibly varied portfolio, and that's called Eyes as Blue as the Sky, which is a song inspired by Angela Carter's novel Wise Children, which has recently been adapted as a play for the stage by Emma Rice. And in it, the character Dora Chance reminisces about a boy that she had loved in her youth whilst duetting with her younger self. And those of you with musical theatre memories will think that's not a million miles away from some of the conceits of follies. And in this recording, you'll hear Claire Moon, who's singing with her daughter Anna Hale. So, in short, Tom's song... Tom's conversation, Tom's other song, Colm's conversation, and then back to me. 
always the least satisfactory part of any episode. I'm sure you'll agree. So, that's me laying out today's menu. Let's dive in and start to eat, he said, trying not to make a terrible metaphor, but creating one nonetheless. Here's that song, The Starry Night. Every street lamp's been ignited Every horse is tethered tight Every shutter has been shuttered Every door's locked for the night Every eyelid's lost its balance And slumps down like dominoes Little dreams dance round the little heads Of people as they doze Pity not the tramps and beggars But those with comfort in their beds Who when they wake will only see Their ceiling overhead They'll miss the nimbus cruising sideways Like a ball across a string Or the change in constellations From the winter to the spring Moonlight beckons Makes me fly Just one in six billion, six billion on one pointless rock Running rings around one pointless sun Which is one in five thousand full stars we can see Just one fifty millionth of our galaxy Can I sit in your orbit or dance on your rings? Can I spin like some other celestial thing and fly? Fetch the paintbrush, fetch the palette, fetch the blacks, the blues, and whites. Pretend that there's a point in painting starry, starry nights. A night that's just like any other, forced to fit our picture frame. Run off half a dozen studies that all end up just the same. Scientists wonder, say. Rings around one point the sun, which is one in five thousand full stars we can see. Just one fifteen billionth of our galaxy. I'd put you on canvas, but would you resent being tied to the ground, which you chose to neglect? You fly. One in six billion, six billion on one point the sun. Running rings around one pointless sun, which is one in five thousand stars we can see. Just one fifteen million of our galaxy. Oh God only knows just what I would do to have wind in my fingers and stars in my shoes. I fly. Musical talk. Well, can I say it's a very welcome return to Tom Arnold to Musical Talk. Tom, it's always good to talk to you. Uh, and I like talking to you both on the record here for Musical Talk and off the record when we see each other periodically to, to see and discuss musicals in real life, for goodness sake. <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> yeah, 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 that was from many, many moons ago. A happy memory. Oh, yes. But 
People will remember you as the composer of The House of Edgar, which was the pick of the Fringe uh, for Musical Talk in 2018. But of course, your interests extend well beyond your own work. Obviously, that would be very uh, <laughs> egotistical. And today, you very kindly agreed to sit down with me to discuss a number of Edinburgh Fringe shows that people could have seen over the last few years, which are available to see on video streaming sites like YouTube. Mm. in order to try and replicate an Edinburgh Festival feeling. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me on, Foss. So you and I are going to sit down and talk today about three shows which we could feasibly have seen if we'd been at Edinburgh in the last few years ourselves. Would you care to name the ones we're going to be talking about mostly? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got Redacted Arachnid, which is from the Maybe You Like It productions, Timpson, the musical which is Giggle Mug Theatre, and The Toxic Avenger, which, am I right in thinking Katie Lipson produced it? It absolutely is, yes. The magnificent British producer, Katie. Yeah, absolutely. She's wonderful. But yes, uh, so those are the three we've got there. And uh, whilst we will be talking about others as well, those are the three we're really going to try and get our teeth into today. Mm. And all three of those are available to watch online in different places. Redacted Arachnid and Timpson are both available on YouTube and Toxic Avenger is available on Broadway HD. But all three are fairly good recordings, and we'll talk about that, I think, as well. Mm. And before we go into this conversation, I think we have to recognise that watching a recording of a live show is never going to be as enjoyable and atmospheric. It's not going to be quite the same experience as seeing that show in any kind of theatrical environment, whether it be a proper theatre like the Arts Theatre or a conference room that's been kitted out for a show in Edinburgh for the Fringe. But Mm. this year, it's all we've got. And we did, before we even started talking on the record today, we did say we thought there were a few through lines and golden threads for these three shows. What naturally comes to mind for you? Uh, For me, these three shows all have a real sense of the kind of the classic Edinburgh Fringe comedy sense of humour that you see in a lot of these shows that rarely makes it outside of Edinburgh in in kind of the musical theatre space. That's true. They're very irreverent, self-aware musicals all three of them well redact arachnid isn't a musical but it's certainly got that kind of sensibility to it we'll talk about what it is in a minute but it, it fits it's all part of the family today as far as we're yeah. concerned absolutely so you're saying they're romps yeah they are they're all three of them are on quite different scales obviously toxic avenger w- went on to the arts theater and was a a much more sort of commercial mainstream piece but they've all got that same yeah it's a reverence to them and silliness that is really the heart of Edinburgh and what a lot of Edinburgh is. And then there are other things as well. Two of them feature superheroes. Absolutely. All three of them feature doubling up, you know, a a limited number of performers who make a virtue of the fact that they are playing more than one character. Yeah. uh, Which is always balanced in each of the three, as indeed should be balanced, by at least one character who stays in character for the whole thing. So all the other characters act like moths round their flame. Mm. It's different numbers of standard characters in each of the shows. But I do quite like that, what I think of as the Travels with My Aunt model. Yes. Which was a very successful stage play for the last 25 years here in London and across the United Kingdom, where they did that kind of thing. This is a Graham Greene adaptation. The Henry character is one actor, and then all the other characters are played by the, the three different performers. Yeah. The 39 Steps did it as well recently. That was the one I was going to say as well. Yeah, the 39 Steps is kind of my touchstone for this kind of, this sense of humour, but yeah. Well, let us start at the beginning then. We're going to start with Redacted Arachnid. Now, this is the unusual one in the three we're going to be talking about today because it is not in its own right a musical and does not feature songs. But what it purports to be is a fairly accurate, although heightened, I think we would have to say that for comic effect, Mm -hmm. interpretation of the public record of what happened in the development of what has now come down to history as one of the biggest flops on Broadway, fairly or unfairly, and that is the Spider-Man musical of a few years ago, which people spoke about for years and years because it took years and years to come out of development and actually get onto the stage. Mm. So the show, in some ways, doesn't really judge the show itself, i.e. the the Spider-Man musical. What it does is it tries to show you the slightly difficult, well, slightly the very difficult gestation period that the show had from inspiration, i.e. when it was going to, you know, when the first person had the idea to put it on, all the way through to actually getting it on and then licking it into shape. Mm. 
that's a very dry way of describing it for what turns out to be a very funny show. What's your take on Redacted Arachnid as a show? Yeah, I really enjoyed this. I really enjoyed this. I must admit, the story of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark and how it kind of got to the stage is one I was quite familiar with already. It's already an absurd story. (laughs) And the way this is dramatised is absolutely brilliant. And it's just... It really understands when just to let the real life story just take over and run with that and also has some really smart comedic devices in how it just delivers things with an extra punch what i was really surprised with it again is sort of being familiar with the overall story and i don't want to spoil things and that kind of thing is how much they also left out or skimmed over just because if people don't know the story of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, it's well worth obviously watching this show because it's really good fun, but also reading the Wikipedia article because there are more elements to it that unfortunately aren't able to be sort of fit into this show. It's, it's a really good time and a really good example of kind of what The Fringe is about as well, of these young independent artists making silly fun clever theater in a sort of a weird mix of accessible but very much off the mainstream kind of way yes that's a really beautiful way of putting it because it's absolutely a fringe show yes you know i I can't see this getting into the west end proper although yet it deserves to be Mm. but it just doesn't feel like it would be absorbed into the west end proper it could be done as a fringe show in london or elsewhere as it was in edinburgh and yet you can't fault it for its professionalism i think for me One of the things I loved about it was that, you know, we glibly talk about the development process here on Musical Talk. We've done it ourselves, you and I, Mm. uh, in another episode talking about the House of Edgar. And I talk about it, you know, development with a lot of people, but it's not always clear what development is. Mm. And because this show, by which I mean Spider-Man, had such an extended development process and one that really was much more Byzantine and convoluted than perhaps it sometimes is, it's not only a funny telling of an interesting story in its own right it's to me it felt like i was being led through an example of a big development process for a big broadway musical that i wouldn't normally get to see it actually opened doors on that process so funnily enough it was educational for me as well as i'm not going to say spoof because i don't think it is a spoof in the heightened retelling done for comedy so it was, it was comedic first, and that was its first principle. Mm. But it, it was also, oh, this is how a development works. You know, from the first person having an idea to workshops, to talking it through, to departments having budgets. I mean, you know, that is something I never talk about. I never <laughs> ever speak to anybody and say, so who controls the budget for costumes? Who controls the budget for special effects? Are they different departments? Mm. Obviously, in Broadway shows, they would be. In a fringe show, they wouldn't be. I'm not sure it makes make fantastic... Uh, broadcasting either let's talk about the budgetary controls on your uh, on your costume design system it's a niche audience you're playing to definitely yeah <laughs> but to see a show that incorporates that even briefly is actually really interesting for me i i, I found it informative oh 100 percent. yes it's a it's a really well-crafted show in the sense that it almost runs like a documentary yes you have a narrator who's taking you through it stage by stage this is what happened next it's clear to their credit that the scenes that are heightened for comedic effect are obviously heightened for comedic effect. And then there's one sequence in particular, which is a TV interview presented completely verbatim. Yes. And that's made abundantly clear as well to be like, okay, this is something that actually happened. So you don't leave with a sense that you've been misled or that any of the story has been um, manipulated in any way to kind of heighten it for its dramatic telling. You, you feel like you have the facts as well as it being sort of an incredibly entertaining piece of theatre. Do you know, that's ab- yes, that is true. It's the sense that there is verisimilitude in what you're being told, that it's merely been polished for comic effect. It hasn't been bent for comic effect, if that makes sense. Yes, mm. I, I think that's a very good point. There's a real knack there for recognising that this story was ripe for a dramatic retelling and almost having the restraint in a weird way in certain sections to just let the absurdity of the true life story work for itself they're very good at punctuating it with the invented comedic moments that are very precisely played and very clever the choreography (laughs) scene in it is one particular one that stands out to me as just utterly hilarious and it comes out of nowhere it's brilliant yeah 
Now, as we were saying, there's lots of doubling. In fact, almost everyone uh, plays more than one character except the narrator character. And the narrator character yeah. ultimately turns out to be the producer who was brought in later in the day to try and save the show and who is mm. in the piece dramatically the voice of reason in a world of creatives gone I'm not going to say mad, but um, let off the leash. Yes. Because it does feel, I mean, uh, this is a judgment call, but the way it seems to come across is that there was a lot of talent. You know, there's never a suggestion that people weren't talented. It's just that, that the creative teams were all pointing at a slightly different direction at every various point of the development until this producer arrives. And it's he brings a lot of the drama to the piece because he has to set all the trains and carriages onto the rails and facing in the same direction again. And there's obviously artistic differences about whether or not that can and should or will be done. But ultimately, money talks. I mean, that's the other lesson that comes out of this, is that you can throw lots of money in and you won't necessarily get a good project. It is the control of money that keeps the ship floating. Yeah, exactly. It's that, as you say, the consistent creative direction and taking it back to the sort of thing you were saying before about budgets and that kind of thing, it's you kind of start to see a lot of people working in different departments and you really see how they don't gel together. Yeah. It's it's really intelligently done. Yes, yeah, that is a very excellent dichotomy. It's absurdist and silly in the lovely sense of silly mm. and hugely intelligent. They do often go together, but sometimes the intelligence is hidden in a show. In this show, Redacted Arachnid, the intelligence i think shines through it really does it doesn't patronize you it doesn't notch anything down it just does it well completely it also has tremendous pace that's the other thing i find fabulous about it i i saw this in the theater a couple of years ago and adored it mm. and r really really enjoyed it. it was one of the highlights of the year for me when i saw it in edinburgh and watching it again on the video platform it was just wonderful to watch it again. But, of course, you do have that slight dissonance, uh, the distance from watching it at one remove by watching it as a video recording. Yeah. But it also allows you to appraise it slightly differently. You know, there's less atmosphere, although there was still an atmosphere generated even on my own in my living room watching it, mm. but less than there would have been in the, in the auditorium. But the balance for that is that you can take a slightly calmer, colder appraisal of it. And what I was really impressed by was how professional a production this was. The pace from the beginning is frenetic, and yet not frenetic in a chaotic way. It's really clickety, 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 going from scene to scene to scene to scene to scene, seamlessly, quickly, like clockwork. So it, it feels anarchic, whilst actually being really well honed from first to last, actually, I thought. It's, it's beautifully directed and beautifully performed at a pace which you rarely see maintained consistently and effectively. Yeah, it's it goes at a, a really good speed. It, it packs a lot of story in, but never too fast for you to stop following it. Because as you say, it is a complicated development process that the show went through. And you do get a sense of kind of the, the main parts of that still. And that goes back to what we were saying before about how it's, it is quite edu sort of educational in a way. It does take you through all of that. It's a shame in a way, so the the way it's been shot is a single camera locked down at the back of the room. It's wonderful to be able, for somebody like me who, I didn't see the show in Edinburgh, it's great that I am able to experience it and I really enjoyed watching it. I don't know if they plan to bring the show back, but obviously I do think a, a preferable way to see it would be to be able to see it in the room. But to be able to have the opportunity to see it now is really great. It's worth checking out. It really is. We, we, I think we both recommend Redacted Arachnid. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it was ultimately more successful uh, than the show it was telling a sto the story about. Yes. Uh, yeah. Probably for rather less money. <laughs> oh, 100%. 100% less money, probably, yes. There's something probably not... Sat satisfying's the wrong word, but there's something fun about the anarchic nature of seeing a tiny fringe show take on what was meant to be a Broadway mega hit. And that, in a way, is almost the David and Goliath nature of the fringe as a whole, in a yes. way, isn't it? That kind of letting people just starting out or the sort of the little man with their tiny new sort of shows really being able to make waves and make an impression with a large audience. I, I think that's right. It's, it's, it is literally, isn't it? It's, it's the acorn versus the oak kind of thing, as you said, David and Goliath. Exactly. Um, but not. But it wasn't adversarial. I think we really do need to stress that. It, it was. Hundred um, percent. It was very careful not to sneer. 
Exactly, exactly. It's very, it's very affectionate in a way. And I think that takes us very nicely into our second show that we're going to be discussing today, which is Timpson mm-hmm. the musical. Now, there can be no show with a more culturally British title, it seems to me, than Timpson the Musical. <laughs> um, and therefore, as we have international listeners, we probably ought to briefly explain what Timpson is. I, would you have to have a crack at their uh, <laughs> describing their commercial approach? They're a shop chain. Yeah, so Timpson is a sort of cobbler's shop. They do shoe repairs um, and they sell keys and locks. It's a slightly unusual combination of products they sell. And it, that seems to be what clearly appealed to these guys in turning it into a a very comedic show, taking something that is very, yeah, specific and unusual. It's a shop that almost feels like it's not from this era, in a sense. It harkens back to a a sort of people with a a very specific skill set and that kind of thing. Well, that ties in exactly with what the show is, because Timpson's Mm -hmm. is exactly, as you say, this slightly odd survival of a shop. It's sort of much loved as well as a shop. You know, people like Timpson's there. People have affection for it. And it does do something still useful. The reason it survived is because people do still need their shoes repaired or keys cut or that kind of thing. Mm. And you find them on station concourses and things like that. So they're often the kind of thing you can pop into on the way home from work in the good old days. (laughs) The story itself is... And similarly to the show we've just spoken about, actually, it's a romp. It's a a comedic take on how the shop came to be in the Victorian era. I should say it's based on no truth whatsoever. That is a big difference. (laughs) Um, Whilst it's been supported by the Timpson family, because Timpson's is still owned by the Timpson family, and indeed we get a cameo by Edward Timpson, the current (laughs) family leader on this, um, which is sort of rather lovely. They've been sort of sponsoring it and looking after the show. They've also given it licence to just find its own way. So it's not... It's not an industrial musical, I think we have to say that. It's not a show which is a musical retelling of how the, sh- how the company came to be. It is a musical show which completely makes up, uh, in a most ridiculous mm. and absurdist way possible, how the company came to be. <laughs> and the very fact that the company <laughs> itself has embraced that is, I think, rather beautiful and wonderful in its own right. There's, sort of, there's something very lovely at the heart of this. Yeah, it's, um, and this also is it's a very clever without wanting to get all boring budgets and stuff on it it's a <laughs> oh come on we've opened the door of budgets already we've today. we've done it it's a very clever funding model in a way for an edinburgh show my understanding is and i could be completely wrong here but my understanding is that they approached timpson and timpson have sponsored the show and that's what's allowed them to be able to put this on in so many places and if timpson hadn't backed it from the off i doubt this show in this particular form would have happened Yeah, it's very irreverent, very, again, coming back to that word, silly. Um, (laughs) But the comedy is sort of very clever and pointed. Well, we were saying how it's a sort of survival from the uh, Victorian era, and indeed it plays on that. Its very first song is called Victorian London. And I tell you what I found, the songs were all very jolly, uh, very palatable to my ear, Mm. and most of the lyrics, I thought, made sense. I mean, we're we're not talking song time. But in, in that song, Victoria London, which is the opening contextual number, we're told that um, Victoria London is a, is a hell of a place. It's uh, moving along at a remarkable <laughs> pace. And then it, it, it does actually set up the context for the rest of the plot by then saying, mm. there's a desolate path uh, waiting ahead, so invent a new one instead. And the idea of inventing your way out of your circumstances is sort of built into the DNA of this show. Absolutely, it's the theme that keeps coming back throughout, it is. isn't it? This idea of finding uh, finding your own way by doing something new, and again, that's the fringe spirit in a in a nutshell, and is very much as well what this show kind of is. This they've come up with a very novel and inventive way of funding and putting on a show at the Edinburgh Fringe. I don't know if you saw them flyering up at the Fringe last year. Oh no, I didn't. They were in their, um, the Timpson aprons, stood outside the Timpson shop that's towards the meadows. No, really? Fantastic. (laughs) Yeah, flyering people there. And so people, I think, most people just took the flyers because they were baffled (laughs) that literally it it was almost as if the Timpson's Edinburgh shop had put the show on themselves. (laughs) It kind of had that weird sort of aesthetic to it. It's great. Well... It, 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 we're told very quickly that the show is going to be silly uh, because uh, there's a talking portrait which acts as the narrator uh, right at the beginning. We, I, uh, and he's a sort of uh, mustachioed Edwardian gentleman or Victorian gentleman. He could very well be an early Timpson. It's not absolutely plain. Mm. And 
what this show does with the doubling up is it does it in a slightly different way to Redacted Arachnid, which had one character staying in character and everyone else doubling up because it's such a big cast of uh, characters. In this case, we have the two central families. It's, it claims to be a take on Romeo and Juliet. Fortunately, it deviates from that fairly quickly yeah. because that will make it a rather drudgy show. And goodness me, haven't we had enough shows that claim to be about <laughs> Ju- uh, Romeo and Juliet? Uh, I'm looking at you, Bear, and many others, in fairness. But um, Bear? Oh, I don't know Bear. Well, I'm not going to say change that status quo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But, but, well, what I mean by that is that Bear is a, a high school musical show that doesn't, isn't afraid to tell you what's going to happen by um, making it all about Juli- uh, Romeo and Juliet at the beginning. Right, I see. You, that ending is signalled well in advance, uh, like within the first three minutes. So this one doesn't do that. It, it, it allows itself to move off from the idea of two rival families quite quickly, or rather the rivalry remains, but it doesn't then follow any of the further tropes. There are a few other sort of parodies throughout, aren't there? There's a reference partway through to Hakuna Matata, from the Lion King um, that seems very overt and a few moments like that where it seems to be very much sort of borrowing from theatre and musical theatre canon in quite a, a fun sort of wink to the audience kind of way fun is the word there yeah absolutely yeah. It, it is a winking at the audience kind of thing and indeed there's a lot of fourth wall breaking I think um, <laughs> Which takes me back to the fact that the doubling up characters, are, there's two of them. Mm. Uh, they're called Alex and Sam. That is the name of the actual actors performing it. It's Sam Cochran and uh, Alex Prescott, I think. Mm. Sam Cochran, I think, is one of the writers. He seems to be the major force behind it, isn't he? Because he's one of the writers and he directed it, I think. Oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah. there you are then. You can't say there than that. <laughs> uh, he and the Alex character are dressed in blacks, essentially. You know, uh, sort of leotard mm. trousers and uh, black uh, shirts. And they play all the other characters around the central family characters. Uh, so that's a big ask. Mm. Uh, they also appear as themselves on occasions. They break <laughs> in and out of character uh, more than anyone else. But it's quite an interesting conceit. It reminded me of a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, actually, funny enough, with an element of that. Yeah. Where there's a team of proteans in that, aren't there? That's they're called. And they sort mm. of play lots of characters. These ones do it with a very knowing wink. I have read a couple of reviews of uh, Timpson where they've uh, where people have said I really loved it but I can see that some people might find this fourth wall breaking a bit excessive now I didn't find it excessive at all although I probably would if it was a two act show uh, did you have a sort of view on uh, cause to me it seemed very versatile and very funny and um, very good at generating an atmosphere and it needed an atmosphere to keep it afloat it was an inflatable show in that sense but what's yeah. your take on that mechanism. Yeah, I was very much for the that device. It's it's reminiscent, as you say, a funny way, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum. But that kind of old kind of storytelling where you have the serious story at the centre and then the comedy duo on the outside, in a way, sort of thinking musical theatre reminded me in a way of like Kiss Me Kate, as well, which has the two mob enforcers who were <laughs> just sort Rush of on up the your Shakespeare. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> which kind of always on the outskirts of it. Uh, It's a fun device. It's also because it always gives them a fun comedy conceit to tell that particular beat of the story. So there aren't any many sort of moments in the story that are told in kind of a traditional scene. The, The scene on London Bridge where we get the... Uh, the deliberately low budget version of London Bridge. So they have to create atmosphere in lots of different ways. It's just a lot of fun ideas thrown at it to to give a sort of a new, fresh comedic spin on beats of a story we've all seen before. It is scattergun in that sense, isn't mm. it? If you were tired by something, then it wasn't going to last very long and you'd move on to the next thing quickly. It had good pace again. There were, there were lots of lovely things. I mean, I'm just going to pluck these from the top of my head. I love the fact the hero's mother was uh, a high-functioning drunk. I mean, yes. it's a terribly tragic story, but she did it with such elan <laughs> and dignity. That was the thing. She was tippling all the way through the show. Yes. Um, but there was huge dignity in that character. I love the fact that our, um, the Alex and Sam characters also came on as dogs occasionally, rather randy dogs. So that, yes. they were puppets. They, they, I should stress. They, um, we, I mean, there's one scene where a dog essentially has the entire coital experience, shall we say? Yes. Uh, and ends up panting on the ground afterwards. <laughs> Yes, it's and that's one of those moments where it's used almost as like there's a an exposition dump almost in that moment. <laughs> Definitely for one of a better word, but the that comedic kind of moment is used to kind of carry that through to the audience. It is funny. Now, what did you make of the score? 
I really liked it. It's very upbeat. It's really fun. And I must admit, quite a few... I can't... I didn't make a note of any um, examples, unfortunately. But there were lyrics that stood out to me where they found some really surprising and unusual rhymes in there that, that were deployed brilliantly to sort of comedic effect. But for me, they were great songs to sort of... Fundamentally, it struck me more as a comedy show than it was a you know, a musical showcase, and the songs are really good for carrying through those, the, that sort of series of sketches almost, those comedy conceits. That's, yes, I think that's a very good point, actually. Um, but I, I don't want to undersell the craft. I mm. think the songs were very successful, and I agree with you, funny enough. I found the melodies and the music excellent, but I found yeah. the lyrics, although not twisty-turny per se, you know, we're not talking uh, Sondheim again, however, they had craft. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to name two of my favourite songs. Uh, one, one of my favourite songs is when we haven't briefly explained the the, the, the setup. The, the Romeo and Juliet element are, but there's one family who are cobblers and are successful. Then there's another family who are uh, who are going who have an invention which doesn't really work, but later evolves into the lock and key. And obviously, you can see where this is going. The two families are going to get together at the end to create modern Simpsons. But the heir, Monty to the uh, Montesquieu family, who's the, the, the cobbler family, realises that he actually hates shoes, and he has a song. Mm. Uh, it's the third song in, I think, uh, which is done in a particularly... I'm going to have to describe this as a kind of 70s, funky, wah-wah yeah. sort of orchestration. It was sort of straight out of Shaft. Kind yeah. of thing. It was that kind of, um, you know, whack, 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 whack kind of uh, electric guitar background mm. going on. And the song is called I Hate Shoes, so that tells you precisely what you need to know. Or, it, or rather, that's how it starts. It's called I've Got a Hole in My Soul. <laughs> <laughs> which is clever because it's a double meaning of course it's it's brilliant he's a cobbler uh, and the soul is spelt both ways but there's a couple of lyrics in it which i thought were rather clever actually it's more in meaning than uh, in rhyme mm. for example i've got i've got it written down here it says um what direction do you choose when you want to be in someone else's shoe because <laughs> it's all about giving up his uh, shoemaking career and going off to become an inventor mm. so as we were saying the inventing part is really important how can you avoid a scandal when you're as useful as achilles sand <laughs> Uh, how can you dance with two left feet? Oh, so um, they are quite witty lyrics, I think. It's very precise. It's very well written. That song actually is a really good example as well where um, the score really comes through. The music, uh, incidentally, is by Tom Slade and Theo Kaplan. I wrote that down. That song is all in 5-4. Is it? Uh, which is, yeah, which is an incredibly difficult time signature to be writing in. And they carry it perfectly and the lyrics are fast throughout it as well it's a really tough setting as it were for a song and it they manage it with great aplomb it's wonderful you've just got my brain bringing on a tangent there um there was a song i think in the late 50s called love is a word for the blues which at the time purported to be the first song written in 5-4 time. And it's particularly tricksy. Mm. It's a lovely song. It's a wonderful song. It's been covered a few times. But it's got a very tricksy rhythm, as you would expect in 5-4. But it's also got lyrics. And that's what the thing at the time was so surprising about it. People said, look, here's this amazing song with lyrics. There's no chance to breathe in it. Yeah. It's really interesting to me that you've immediately picked up that the, uh, the song A Hole in My Soul is in that same time signature. Um, and has the same characteristics. Sorry, yeah. no, forgive me. I'm just throwing back to what purported to be the first 5-4 song. Whether it was is someone else's decision, not mine. It reminded me in a way of sort of early Andrew Lloyd Webber work. It was something early on in his career. He was very interested in playing with time signatures. And you get songs like The Temple in Jesus Christ Superstar that have lyrics that just carry through. The, their sort of way through those time signatures was just for the lyrics not to let up. So if you listen to uh, The Temple is a really good example. That's in 7, 8, I think. But all the way through, it's going... It's using that element that it's almost like there's a beat missing. Yeah. So you've got to jump on straight away to the bit. Um, and that's the Hole in My Soul song is, that you've pointed out. It's, it's very much a stream of consciousness all the way through it. And it's using that element of that time signature so well. Throughout it. Funnily enough, I think they know they've got a good song there because they also light it rather differently. There's a sort of a, a kind of red yeah. glow on the thing, a much darker staging. Mm. And then the Monty actor does, it's not quite a fossy dance, but he's on stage on his own. He does do what 
could only be described as sort of cold fossy. Yeah. In, but in a very frantic way, because you don't think of fossies dancing as being frantic. It's sort of a, a, mm. often a set. I mean, you and I uh, uh, have got things to say about Bob Fosse as a, a choreographer <laughs> and will d- will do so on musical talk in the future. But very often it's a kind of moving from one pose to another is the easiest mm. way to reductively boil it down. So that's what was going on here. But frantically, yeah. which really sort of summed up the, 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 um, the pain the actor was sort of going through, even mm. in this sort of comic sense. I do just want to move on to the next song, funnily enough, which um, in the piece, which was the love song between the daughter of the key maker, shall we say, yeah. want for a better phrase, and the, the son of the, the shoe um, maker. And it was the love song. I don't know what it was called, but it did that. I find this very funny where they take the same rhyme scheme. It's not it's a a a a a a a as a rhyme yeah. scheme kind of thing. So I wrote these ones down. This crazy feeling It's the feeling of me reeling, of my heart hitting the ceiling, and I think I am revealing this crazy feeling. Yes. Like an onion, I am peeling. And it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> and you'd think that might be a bit relentless, but actually, it, it's, the, 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 this was the great secret of it. You could tell it was happening, and yet it wasn't tiresome. No. And it, was the, and it wasn't as if it was a comic verse to sort of do that as a one-off. It was the chorus that kept coming back using that rhyme scheme and yet as you say it was really well set uh, in its um, score and in its music it was lovely and I will just mention a song later on which purported to be a sing-along yes <laughs> which was sung ostensibly by our two sort of um, everyman characters as fishermen sort of um, <laughs> odd odd fishermen I think would be the song describing them and the song I think it's called Life is Dire or yeah. something like that and it purports to be a sort of jolly jolly sing-along and it sets you up for isn't life terrible it has some fairly crude lyrics, but mm. life is terrible, terrible, terrible. I mean, it brings you up to, and there's only one way to deal with it, and you think it's going to be an uplifting chorus, like always look on the bright side of life. Mm. It's, it's going to give you a chorus where it tells you to buck up, <laughs> be cheerful, and everything will turn out right. And so they, they've given you this long list of why life is absolutely terrible. They sort of build up to this climax, which is, and here's what you do. And then there's suddenly an absolutely silent beat. And then very angrily and in complete synchronicity, they stare at the audience and shout, sit in silence and accept it. <laughs> it sort of completely undercuts the optimism of the song. It's, it's absolutely live with your lot, you rotters. <laughs> mm. That was the song as well that we, I drew the Hakuna Matata parallel with. It's kind of, it's purporting to, yeah, it's a spin on, as you say, that always look on the bright side kind of attitude. And at the same time, it's used as a character grows up over a period of time while being looked after by rather odd comedy double act. Yes, I think that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, rather odd. And as you say as well, it's this is a really good use as well of the fact that it is filmed. Yes. Unfortunately, spoiling one of the jokes here, but the, the lyrics each time the chorus comes up, comes up on screen with a little fish bouncing over the top like those old sort of Disney VHSs for sing-alongs and that kind of thing. It's a really great use of the fact that it is on film and being watched on YouTube. And just as a whole as well, the whole thing is shot, considering I'm guessing they're on a fairly low budget, The it's shot really, really well. Oh yes, it's very professional, isn't it? Yeah, it's really slick and it's a really entertaining watch. It's well worth checking out, this one. There is just one more lyric I want to pick up, uh, because I love the idea of subverting songs. And and in in this Mm. kind of show, with this kind of feel, you can do that. There's another song where advice is being given. I think the advice, once again, is being given to Monty or possibly to the key-cutting daughter. I've forgotten her name, which is terrible. I'm so sorry. But... um, it's got the standard things, you know, um, you've got to get up when they knock you down. So far, so average, you know. It's the kind of mm. pick yourself up, dust yourself off and start all over again, you know. If this is the yeah. Dorothy Field spoof. But whilst it doesn't give you a handbrake turn as the one I was just talking about did, the sing-along, what it does is the quality of the advice is extremely variable or obvious. So, yes. so for the, you know, <laughs> you've got to get up when they knock you down. Right, good, very sort of anthemic stuff. And then there's other ones like uh, always say thanks after sex. Uh, never, eat, <laughs> never eat a taco from the bin. From a bin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you that remember it. One, it's yeah, stuck in the memory. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... That, you know, that's just a list of stupid advice, basically. Yeah. And therefore very, very funny. I, I, I mean, we've been talking about the songs and the score here. The performances were brilliant. I, I, you know, I really enjoyed every minute mm. of this show. But I think the score 
is secretly a lot better than it's allowing us to think it is. Absolutely. I think it's doing so much more with so much more craft than just a knockabout comedy. It's also doing really interesting stuff, particularly in the first few songs with genre. It's sat in a or in a kind of funk rock soul kind of mode that doesn't seem like the obvious choice of genre for this type of show for a victorian yeah <laughs> and it and it marries perfectly with the tone and the sense of humor of the whole thing um particularly as you were saying when you then get into the holding my soul song where it's the guitar is very much on the wah wah pedal <laughs> all the way through it and that kind of thing it's yeah it's great i i i, I I love the fact that you've yeah that, you've, that we've both reached the same kind of conclusion from um, uh, from slightly different perspectives. You know, you're much more musically minded, yeah. and I'm sort of much more word minded. Um, and then mm. I will just mention the very last song is the one song in this entire show that feels like it could have come from a more traditional industrial musical. And by industrial musical, I'm using a, a term which is not widely known, but in the fifties, sixties, and seventies, for the most part, big American corporations often hired proper professional Broadway performers and composers to write a show about the the goods that the company was producing essentially which they would then perform maybe once or two times at a sales convention when the entire staff were gathered in one hotel they'd occasionally yeah. be recorded so you know vinyl albums will be presented to the the delegates there and then that would be the end of it so you'd, you'd get full budget broadway quality broadway style shows not in every case but in some cases mm. you know candor and ebb did one yeah. called go fly a kite for the general electric company it's a really <laughs> interesting sub-genre of musical theater oh right but they often obviously extol the virtues of what the company is selling mm. and the last song in the timpson musical which is which would or could have been an industrial musical if it had been made 50 years ago is called timpson the quality service people and it is actually if you like the anthem to timpson's today as a really good shop and it's the one song in the entire piece I'm, i assume by accident that you think oh if this had been an industrial musical piece yeah this is the kind of song that the entire score would have been like. Yeah. But because it's only one, and you've enjoyed the show so far, that it's, it's, it's a terrible thing to say. This song is very forgivable. It's the one that's most like an advert, mm -hmm. but it actually fits the score perfectly. So it, it's, 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 um, it's earned its place. Oh, completely. It feels like the song that Timpson probably... Would have liked, yes. It's the <laughs> that's the bankrolling one, yeah. But it's, it, no, it's, you're exactly right. And also there's an element of... The show's called Timps and the Musical, isn't it? <laughs> yes. So I think you, you go in expecting at least one of those. No, it's good fun. It's, really, it's a really enjoyable piece. In my 
my defense. I knew a boy, I knew him in the past tense, if that even makes sense. I knew a boy in whom I could confide, who would be by my side. He was here, gone tomorrow, like the turn of the tide. He had cheeks moving, he had cheeks there, moving not a wrinkle, not a wrinkle, and, hair, and, hair, and, hair, and, and the silk, silk, and the silk. thrill of a boy who would leave like the rest in due time. But his eyes, he has eyes. eyes as Uh, we move on to a play about a musical. Yes, which is a rare enough thing, I think. I can't think of that many. You probably know the... St- this is a historic throwback, but I th- is it The Pajama Game? The Pajama Game was based on a book, I think. And the writer Possibly. of the book was involved in the creation of the musical when it happened and then wrote another book about the creation of how his book had been musicalised, which was then in itself musicalised. What was the second musical? Now, that I cannot tell you, and it was quite a fringe piece uh, uh, in America years and years ago. But the idea that this one book had somehow created two musicals in a further book (laughs) is quite in itself interesting. This isn't of that nature, but the play itself was called Redacted Arachnid, Mm -hmm. which immediately tells you that it was a comic rendering of as far as is possible to identify the true-ish story of the famous Spider-Man musical of only a few years ago. This is the the one that had music by Bono of Mm -hmm. U2 and was famously hugely expensive and famously had to be rejigged on a whole number of occasions and never quite recouped its losses I understand even though it was sort of more or less set on its feet by the end it was just too little too late Mm. Uh, and has possibly unfairly sort of gone down as one of the great big flops in the history of Broadway and yet actually when you know the story what it was was a extremely difficult troubled worrying process to get it on stage but actually once they'd finished with it there was a workable product it just isn't that isn't how it's remembered and this comedy told that story and so uh, whilst it's not a musical and we shouldn't dwell on it for too long I should say it was genuinely interesting watching a play about creating a Broadway musical a big Broadway musical and the obvious trappings that could come from that but what it did was it did it with a beautifully tongue-in-cheek tone whilst at the same time telling its story sort of sincerely because uh, I I spoke very briefly to the writer afterwards and he told me that um, it was their intention to try and get the story as understood um, to the public Uh, and there have been books written about it and of course there's a lengthy Wikipedia page and a very lengthy review by Ben Brantley of the New York Times he wrote a scathing review of the show oh, in its first incarnation yeah, I bet, yeah. I think. well also there's um, in the piece that we see we see uh, 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 an, I, obviously it's impossible to some of it will have been dramatised or imagined as what might have happened in various conversations because they won't all have been recorded but they do illustrate a rather awkward television appearance by the cast after the stuntman playing the Spider-Man element of Peter Parker's character mm. had had a massive, massive accident. And that was quite telling in itself because it was clear from the performance based on a real performance, if it makes sense, that people were not very comfortable. Sure. Of course, the difficulty is for us as an audience, Watts, it was a highly enjoyable piece, but it's difficult to know how truthful it was. I know there were attempts to make it as truthful as possible. It was also very careful not to say anything inappropriate about anyone it was periodically the story is told for the most part through a not not quite a narrator character but it's a money man who's a producer who takes over the running of the show and eventually helps get it into shape at the very end sure and so it's his account if it's anyone's within the dramatic context of the piece and he periodically lets you know when something you're seeing is an absolute word-for-word transcription or absolutely truthful from the public record which implies the rest of it is as imagined from the facts which are available as are known as far as they are known. It's a difficult thing to say there and obviously the sensitivity of the piece is reflected in its title which is Redacted Arachnid. A brave title because I don't think it would necessarily bring many people in because it's quite a complicated term unless you think about it and you immediately realise oh I know what this musical is about. It never quite says 
the name that you're expecting it to say mm-hmm. all the way through but that of course is a course for comedy in its own right so I really enjoyed it I thought it was a great great show and I'd see it again any old time but, um, but it's interesting as I say to see a play a comic play but a play about the creation of a musical and you don't often get that kind of popular culture will eat itself it's usually putting on a musical about putting on a musical or um, let's put on a show you know show business love celebrating show business in its own context it does yeah. uh, but it doesn't often do it outside of its own format if that makes sense is that fair yeah I yeah. think so have you ever seen anything like that or come across anything of that nature play about failings of theatre well I, not so much that just any kind you know a, a a show which is about putting on a show but is putting on a show which is a different nature a play about putting on a musical or a musical about sure. putting on a play because you do see them all the time yeah, you know Hells of Poppin oh. is a very famous example of pretty much anything that featured Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney <laughs> Yeah. almost always end up with let's put on a show well a musical about a musical is always a very common thing as well I wonder not to my knowledge yeah it's curious isn't it I want to think about musical talk well there we are that was Colin Malloy recorded in a conversation with me in 2019 which was the last Edinburgh Festival Fringe actually to take place in a physical form talking about our take on Redacted Arachnid. And before that, you heard a much longer conversation with the wonderful Tom Arnold talking about that self-same show and also Timpson the musical. And that was, if you like, sandwiched between two songs by Tom himself, The Starry Night and Eyes As Blue As The Sky. And each and every element of today's show can be seen online because Redacted Arachnid and Timpson's The Musical can both be seen in full and rather excellent recordings, and so can Tom's songs for Starry Night and I As Blue As The Sky. And on those YouTube recordings, you'll also find the full credits of the fantastic musicians who helped out with those YouTube videos. And don't forget, next week, we'll be hearing more from Tom as we talk about The Toxic Avenger, yet another superhero who's made it to the world of musical theatre. It's a great show. And that's reflected, I think, in a great conversation with Tom. So do tune in for that. But for the time being, I think that really does bring this episode to an end. And I can guarantee that because I have, as you know, a word which in a way is more of an incantation. And that incantation can magically transform conversation into silence. Or at least the theme tune. So I'm going to say it now. Goodbye. This episode of Musical Talk edited by Thos Ribbits and presented by Thos Ribbits, Tom Arnold and Colin Malloy. Copyright Musical Talk 2020. Except for the songs where the copyright remains with the original creators. And my enormous thanks go to Tom Arnold for allowing me to play his wonderful songs in this episode. To find out more about the world of musical talk and listen to past episodes, go along to our website www.musicaltalk.co.uk or subscribe to us on iTunes and follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, you can at MusicalTalkThos. I think Patrick Troughton always used to, um, he did a vocal warm up before broadcasting, which was to say Harry Roy, who was a band leader from the 1930s. He would say Harry Roy over again. And it does actually give the mouth a beautiful sort of um, Harry, Harry Roy, Harry Roy. It certainly it gets the vowels in place, which is nice. Everyone wants a vowel movement. So. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh man, Harry Roy. Yeah. That is quite a difficult one, isn't it? Harry Roy, Harry yeah, Roy. Yeah, but I, it's the one I use when I need to make my mouth a bit more dexterous. <laughs> right. 100%. Yeah, it's. Uh... Sorry, I went into that sentence not knowing how I was going to get out of it. Give me a sec. <laughs> oh, I do that all the time. That's like, that's, that's my <laughs> <talk. laughs> Um Do you know, you've just set a little bell ringing with me. There was a, a, mm. a song, a popular song in the 50s or 60s uh, called, um, oh, crikey. <laughs> Give me two seconds. It's called, oh, crikey. <laughs> yeah, it was sung by Terry Scott and it was a novelty record. Um, yeah. 
No, I've got it because I've actually got a copy somewhere. Give me two, if you can just give me two seconds. Of course, of course. 